And today's new reading is the 28th reading, 28th talk in this collection. And this is entitled here, Tranquility and Insight. And this was originally published in the book, A Taste of Freedom. Uh, also um, originally translated by Puriso. And this is um, from an informal talk given in the Northeastern dialect, taken from an un unidentified tape. And it was published uh, in Taste of Freedom under the title, On Meditation. Tranquility and Insight. To calm the mind means to find the right balance. If you try to force your mind too much, it goes too far. If you don't try enough, it doesn't get there. It misses the point of balance. Normally the mind isn't still, it's moving all the time. We must make an effort to strengthen the mind. Make the mind strong, and making the body strong are not the same. To make the body strong we have to exercise it, to push it. But to make the mind strong means to make it peaceful, not to go thinking of this and that. For most of us, the mind has never been peaceful. It has never had the energy of samadhi. So we must establish it within a boundary. We sit in meditation, staying with the one who knows. If we force our breath to be too long or too short, we're not balanced. The mind won't become peaceful. It's like when we first start to use a pedal sewing machine. At first, we just practice pedaling the machine to get our coordination right, before we actually sew anything. Following the breath is similar. We don't get concerned over how long or short, weak or strong it is. We just note it. We simply let it be, following the natural breathing. When our breathing is balanced, we take it as our meditation object. When we breathe in, the beginning of the breath is at the nose tip, the middle of the breath at the chest, and the end of the breath at the abdomen. This is the path of the breath. When we breathe out, the beginning of the breath is at the abdomen, the middle at the chest, and the end at the nose tip. Simply take note of this path of the breath, at the nose tip, the chest, and the abdomen, then at the abdomen, the chest, and the tip of the nose. We take note of these three points in order to make the mind firm, to limit mental activity so that mindfulness and self-awareness can easily arise. When our attention settles on these three points, we can let them go and note the in, breath, the in and out breathing, concentrating solely at the nose tip or the upper lip, where the air passes, or, where the air passes, or, oh, see, where the air passes on its in and out passage. We don't have to follow the breath; we just establish mindfulness in front of us at the nose tip, and note the breath at this one point, entering, leaving, entering, leaving. There's no need to think of anything special. Just concentrate on this simple task for now, having continuous presence of mind. There's nothing more to do. Just breathe in and breathe out. Soon the mind becomes peaceful, the breath refined. The mind and body become light. This is the right state for the work of meditation. When sitting in meditation, the mind becomes refined. But we should try to be aware, to know whatever state it's in. Mental activity is there together with tranquility. There is vitaka. Vitaka is the action of bringing the mind to the theme of contemplation. If there's not much mindfulness, there will be not much vitaka. Then vichara, the contemplation around that theme, follows. Various weak mental impressions may arise from time to time, but our self-awareness is the important thing. Whatever may be happening, we know it continuously. As we go deeper, we are constantly aware of the state of our meditation, knowing whether or not the mind is firmly established. Thus, both concentration and awareness are present. Having a peaceful mind does not mean that there is nothing happening. Mental impressions do arise. For instance, when we talk about the first level of, of absorption, we say it has five factors. Along with vitaka and vichara, piti arises with the theme of contemplation and then sukha. These four things all lie together in the mind that is established in tranquility. They are as one state. The fifth factor is ekagata, or one-pointedness. You may wonder how there can be one-pointedness when there are all these other factors going on as well. This is because they all become unified on that foundation of tranquility. Together, they are called a state of samadhi. They are not everyday states of mind. 
They are factors of absorption. There are these five characteristics, but they do not disturb the basic tranquility. There is vitaka, but it doesn't disturb the mind. Vichara, rapture and happiness arise, but do not disturb the mind. The mind is therefore as one with these factors. The first level of absorption is like this. We don't have to call it first jhana, second jhana, third jhana and so on. Let's just call it a peaceful mind. As the mind becomes progressively calmer, it will dispense with vitaka and vichara, leaving only rapture and happiness. Why does the mind discard vitaka and vichara? This is because as the mind becomes more refined, the activities of vitaka and vichara are too coarse to remain. At this stage, as the mind leaves off vitaka and vichara, feelings of great rapture can arise. Tears may gush out. But as the samadhi deepens, rapture too is discarded leaving only happiness and one-pointedness. Until finally even happiness goes, and the mind reaches its greatest refinement. There is only equanimity and one-pointedness. All else has been left behind. The mind stands unmoving. Once the mind is peaceful, this can happen. You don't have to think a lot about it. It just happens by itself when the causal factors are ripe. This is called the energy of a peaceful mind. In this state, the mind is not drowsy. The five hindrances, sense desire, aversion, restlessness, dullness and doubt, have all fled. But if mental energy is still not strong and mindfulness is weak, there will occasionally arise intruding mental impressions. The mind is peaceful, but it's as if there is a cloudiness within the calm. It's not a normal sort of drowsiness, though. Some impressions will manifest. Maybe you'll hear a sound or see a dog or something. It's not really clear, but it's not a dream either. This is because these five factors have become unbalanced and weak. The mind tends to play tricks with these levels of tranquility. Imagery will sometimes arise when the mind is in this state through any of the senses, and the meditator may not be able to tell exactly what's happening. Am I sleeping? No. Is it a dream? No, it's not a dream. These impressions arise from a middling sort of tranquility. But if the mind is truly calm and clear, we don't doubt the various mental impressions or imagery which arise. Questions like, did I drift off then? Was I sleeping? Did I get lost? They don't arise, but they are characteristics of a mind which is still doubting. Am I asleep or awake? Here, the mind is fuzzy. This is the mind getting lost in its moods. It's like the moon, go the moon going behind a cloud. You can still see the moon, but the clouds covering it render it hazy. It's not like the moon, which has emerged from behind the clouds, clear, sharp and bright. When the mind is peaceful and established firmly in mindfulness and self-awareness, there will be no doubt concerning the various phenomena which we encounter. The mind will truly be beyond the hindrances. We will clearly know everything which arises in the mind as it is. We do not doubt because the mind is clear and bright. The mind which reaches samadhi is like this. Some people find it hard to enter samadhi because they don't have the right tendencies. There is samadhi, but it's not strong or firm. However, one can attain peace through the use of wisdom, through contemplating and seeing the truth of things, solving problems that way. This is using wisdom rather than the power of samadhi. To attain calm in practice, it's not necessary to be sitting in meditation. For instance, just ask yourself, Hey, what is that? And solve your problems right there. A person with wisdom is like this. Perhaps he can't really attain high levels of samadhi, although there must be some concentration, just enough to cultivate wisdom. It's like the difference between farming rice and farming corn. One can depend on rice more than corn for one's livelihood. Our practice can be like this. We depend more on wisdom to solve problems. When we see truth, peace arises. The two ways are not the same. Some people have insight and are strong in wisdom, but do not have much samadhi. When they sit in meditation, they aren't very peaceful. They tend to think a lot, contemplating this and that, until eventually they contemplate happiness and suffering and see the truth of them. Some incline more towards this than samadhi. Whether standing, walking, sitting or lying, enlightenment of the Dhamma can take place. Through seeing, through relinquishing, they attain peace. They attain peace through knowing the truth, through going beyond doubt, because they've seen it for themselves. Other people have only little wisdom, but their samadhi is very strong. They can enter very deep samadhi quickly, 
But not having much wisdom, they cannot catch their defilements. They don't know them. They can't solve their problems. But regardless of whichever approach we use, we must do away with wrong thinking, leaving only right view. We must get rid of confusion, leaving only peace. Either way, we end up at the same place. There are these two sides to practice, but these two things, calm and insight, go together. We can't do away with either of them. They must go together. That which looks over the various factors which arise in meditation is sati, mindfulness. This sati is a condition which, through practice, can help other factors to arise. Sati is life. Whenever we don't have sati, when we are heedless, it's as if we're dead. If we have no sati, then our speech and actions have no meaning. Sati is simply recollection. It's a cause for the arising of self-awareness and wisdom. Whatever virtues we have cultivated are imperfect if they are lacking in sati. Sati is that which watches over us while standing, walking, sitting and lying. Even when we are no longer in samadhi, sati should be present throughout. Whatever we do, we take care. A sense of shame, that is a wholesome sense of shame based on knowledge of cause and effect rather than emotional guilt. A sense of shame will arise. We will feel ashamed about the things that we do which aren't correct. As shame increases, our collectedness will increase as well. When collectedness increases, heedlessness will disappear. Even if we don't sit in meditation, these factors will be present in the mind. And this arises because of cultivating sati. Develop sati. This is the quality which looks over the work that we're doing in the present. It has real value. We should know ourselves all the time. If we know ourselves like this, right will distinguish itself from wrong. The path will become clear, and the cause for all shame will dissolve. Wisdom will arise. We can bring the practice all together as morality, concentration and wisdom. To be collected, to be controlled, this is morality. The firm establishment of the mind within that control is concentration. Complete overall knowledge within the activity in which we are engaged is wisdom. The practice in brief is just morality, concentration and wisdom, or in other words, the path. There is no other way.